Hello everyone and thank you for attending our NetIQ webinar today. As we are joined here by NetIQ Solutions Consultant Alain Solis and he'll be going through the webinar with you. Thank you, I'm Alain Salis, I'm a Solutions Consultant for NetIQ and today I'm going to talk to you about our workload management solutions and how they can help with the end of life of Windows Server 2003. So just by way of an agenda, I'll give you a little bit of background on who we are as an organization, how our technology can help with the end of life of Server 2003, and then we'll delve into Plexbin Migrate in a little bit more detail, show you some of its capabilities, and look at various upgrade scenarios for 2003 servers before I walk, give you an actual walkthrough of the product so you can actually see what it looks like, and then we'll go into a Q&A at the end. So NetIQ is a brand uh, that's owned by Microfocus International, which comprises a few other brands as well, including Nobel, Suzy, Borland, and Attachmate. And we are a pretty large organization, 1.4 billion in sales, and we're a global organization as well. And focusing on NetIQ specifically, our solutions fit into two primary areas. One is around IT operations, which is where Plexbin fits in, and also we uh, have solutions around identity access management, security and uh, access governance solutions. And our solutions are to help organizations manage and secure and measure the services regardless of what platform they're del delivered on, be that physical, virtual or cloud. So within the IT operations management space within NetIQ, we have a number of different solutions which encompass systems management, disaster recovery, workload migration, and uh, voice over IP management. And the Platespin portfolio has four main products within it. There's Platespin Recon, Migrate, Protect, and Forge. So Recon and Migrate are what I'm going to talk to you today about. So Recon is around data center planning. So it's a tool that can help you analyze and plan your capacity, do server consolidation planning, disaster recovery planning, and it certainly has uh, a good role to play within the uh, area of planning for doing serv server upgrades. And then Migrate, which is will help you move your workload from any, other pla any platform to any other platform, regardless of what the source or target is, and that's what we're going to focus most of that um, today's webinar on. And then because we have the best of breed capability within the marketplace to do any to any migration, we actually can leverage that capability to offer virtualization as a disaster recovery platform. So in this scenario, you can basically do scheduled uh, migration of your servers onto VMware, and in the event of a DR situation, that machine, the VMware machine, can take over the business function of the, the source until such time as you replace it or repair it, and then you have a one-click failback. So I'll just um, outline some of the challenges we've seen uh, around upgrading from Windows Server 2003. Um, it's largely around the capa capacity and compatibility of hardware, whether old hardware that Server 2003 is sitting on has enough processor and memory, um, and is the OS partition large enough to accommodate an upgrade. Um, yeah. Server 2003 could be installed on as little as 5 gig of space, so whereas 2008 is going to need at least twice that and, and probably more, so is there actually enough disk space within the OS volume to uh, accommodate that? And does the hardware itself support the uh, the a new OS, and that, that's true whether it's a physical server or um, a virtual server, the hypervisor may not support new operating systems. There's also a big challenge around application compatibility. Some applications can't be upgraded or not supported on new operating systems, so how do you deal with those? And when you start migrating and upgrading servers, how do you back them out if there's a problem? Because you can't uninstall server 2008. So assuming that these are the challenges that um, Platespin technology can help you with. So when, if you do decide that you're going to migrate that 2003 server to another platform, be it physical or virtual, there are various migration 
options available to you. Of course, you can do a manual re rebuild, but that is labor intensive, time intensive, and error prone. So it's not a, a usual approach. There are various free tools out there that will migrate you onto VMware or Hyper-V or other hypervisors, for example, um, but they have fairly limited capabilities. They usually require a fair amount of uh, manual effort and each there's a different tool for each vendor. So there is one, isn't one common tool that will do that. And of course, there are various third party tools of which now IQ uh, has has some, but there are differences in the features and the price and the performance of those. So let's say you're going to do this manually. You could take an image of the server and uh, transfer it, but um, it's it's a labor intensive process and it's error prone and there's a, a lot of downtime uh, involved in that. So it's quite disruptive to the business to do that. You can use free migration tools, but there's a lot of manual steps in there, like having to do sys prep machines and build target operating systems and so forth. They're typically not well designed to work over the network and they're not particularly scalable. So if you have a large number of servers that you need to move, then they don't, they, they don't scale particularly well. So I'll just outline at a high level how our technology can help organizations who are planning server 2003 upgrades. First of all, Plate Spin Recon, uh, it can do a number of things. So it can tell you what's out there. So it can inventory your environment. It can find what workloads are out there, including the server 2003 ones. It can give you detailed information about those systems tell you what software is in, uh, installed on, on the versions of those software so you can see where potential issues might be from a, uh, a compatibility problem uh, perspective. You can also use Recon to re report on the resource utilization of servers, how much of their capacity that they're using so that when you are planning to virtualize them or move them onto other equipment, you can right size that, that platform. You may have a mixture of underutilized, overutilized machines, and Recon will help you identify which machines are good virtualization candidates. So you're potentially looking for the ones that don't use quite as much resources and are not highly utilized. And when you when you've decided which ones are the best candidates to be virtualized, uh, Recon will help you right size the environment and get you the the right amount of hardware that you need to deliver every workload, the resources that it requires without overspecking it basically. So you can right size your environment. So really it's about helping you to find the right upgrade path for each server. So whether to virtualize it, whether to do an in situ upgrade or to move it to another physical server, depending on how that workload is actually used. So Migrate can actually perform the migrations to a new piece of hardware be that physical or virtual. It's a highly automated system, it's very scalable and it's safe as you'll see when we go through the, uh, that in more detail. And one of the things I'll point out here is that we can alt automatically take care of things like um, increasing disk volume. So if your OS partition is not big enough to accommodate server 2008 for example, then Migrate can take care of that automatically and give make sure there's enough space for when you do the upgrade. So you can basically get your workload into a position where you can upgrade it with confidence. You have it on a new platform that you know will support the new OS, has enough resources to run it, and you're going to have enough disk space to, uh, to perform the upgrade. You can also do testing, as much testing as you want of the server before you uh, after up before and after the upgrade and make sure that it's all okay before you decommission the the source server. And once you have Plate Spin Migrate, should you ever need to migrate it to other pl another platform in the future, then the licensing allows for that. So you have future portability should you need it. So when we talk to organizations about mi migrating servers, there are some common challenges that we see and they, they fall into these sort of three main areas of cost, risk and complexity. So migration is a, a complex task. It's often time consuming. It takes a lot of effort and it involves a lot of system uh, disruption and downtime. So how can you sort of minimize those factors while making sure that 
you when you're doing these cutover weekends that you can complete the cutovers in time and verify that the systems are running successfully and if you encounter a problem how do you get back and when you, if you're working in a an environment with multiple platforms multiple um, hypervisors windows and linux potentially then you don't particularly want to be using multiple tools to do that so how do you manage that and how do you scale to do many systems simultaneously so these are the sorts of um, issues that we can help with our technology. So Migrate will move a workload which is basically everything sitting above the operating system. So it's the OS, it's the applications, it's the data. So everything that you would think of as the server minus the hardware effectively. And we can move that server from any platform to any other platform automatically. And there are a number of use cases, obviously, which Server 2003 is, is one of them, but potentially also for um, reviewing hardware leases, doing consolidation projects, re relocating data centers, those sorts of activities are all things that you can use Migrate for. So when you look at the migration tools that are out there in the marketplace, they typically fall into two uh, types. You have tools that will do a live migration from your source machine to your, your target and that has a benefit of having a very short service outage but the challenge there is that you have no ability to test post migration and there's no way to fail back if something goes wrong. So that's a potentially a risky uh, approach to take. The alternative typically is an offline migration where you, you do have the ability to test your workload and fail it back if necessary, but the downside is that there's a very long service outage because you have to take the system offline to do that. So that could be costly to the business. Place in Migrate kind of gives you the best of both worlds. You have the ability to test and fail back your workload, but combine that with um, a short service outage. So with minimal disruption, so you really get the best of both worlds with uh, our technology. So the process for migrating workloads with Platespin Migrate is you take a copy of your workload while it's still performing its normal business function. You don't turn anything off. If you need to, you can do your testing and verification, make sure that that machine is now working okay. And then once you've completed that, you can do uh, do some incremental synchronizations and bring that target machine up to date with respect to the source. And you can do that as many times as you wish. And then the fourth and final step is a, a cutover sync where you stop the application, you reconfigure the target machine to assume the identity of the original machine and everything just switches over. So that's where your small period of down, downtime will occur. So just to talk a bit about some of the features of it, we have the the best of breed any to any migration capability on the marketplace. We're pretty well hard, hardware agnostic. So we cover all the main hypervisors like VMware, Hyper-V, Zen. We don't uh, physical and also image, which I'll talk on to later. Uh, our technology also supports Windows and Linux servers. Obviously the focus of today is around Windows and Server 2003, but if you have Linux workloads, they can be moved as well. And we have a huge amount of automation that's built into the product. So we optimize the drivers automatically. We optimize the OS kernel for the new hardware that it's going on to. And you can also modify the host settings, if you like. Things like the number of CPUs, amount of memory. You can resize disks. You can change network configuration. We also take care of hypervisor tools automatically. So if you're going on to VMware, for example, we install VMware tools similarly for a Hyper-V or we'll swap them out if you're going between two hypervisors. And we can um, configure uh, Windows services um, both during the migration and post-migration as well. And you have the ability, if that's not enough flexibility, we have the ability to run any form of script or command line activities automatically after the migration has completed. So we take a lot of the effort out of the migration, which means it's much easier to scale it as well. So we also have a uh, 
a staged transfer capability using images. So this is primarily around doing data center moves or where you, you're moving a, a system across the WAN and you have a fairly low bandwidth um, connection or high, highly utilized connect, connection. So basically what you can do is you can take a, an offline copy of your workloads from the first data center, you can put, put that in a van, move it over to the other data center and then use that as the seed for doing an incremental sync over the WAN. So the main data is done via SneakerNet basically, which is a, maybe a much more efficient way of doing it. We have um, both a GUI which allows you to uh, control the migration jobs. It gives you very, it's very easy to use. It gives you, uh, you step through a wizard basically. It shows you all the configuration options and what you need to, to fill in. But we also have a command line alternative which is very useful if you want to kind of get into batch processing and start um, doing things uh, in a more scalable way or in a more automated way so you can script these tasks within in batch files, PowerShell files, VB scripts, automation workflow engines that you may have, anything you've got that can, can schedule these activities basically so you can do a lot of unattended stuff with the uh, command line interface. And uh, that really helps if you're planning sort of large scale migrations. So if we imagine a scenario where you want to cut over a number of servers, you're going to start several weeks in advance. So in the first weekend, you set up a number of uh, full replications of your workloads and you start, you schedule them, say, for nightly uh, incremental syncs. Then the following weekend, you do the next batch. And the third weekend, you do the next batch. And then the fourth weekend, you actually cut them over. Um, and because you've been replicating these on a nightly basis, there's not actually that much data to transfer. So the cutover period is actually relatively short. And then maybe you, the following weekend you start again and you, you kind of go on this rolling process. We're not limited to 10, by the way. It's just what I put on the slide. It is quite a scalable product. You can do, do more than this. So some of the... Uh, benefits of using our technology, come back to the challenges that I outlined before. It's around reducing the cost involved in performing these migrations, the ability to uh, do lots of simultaneous migrations, high levels of automation, which take out all the uh, manual effort and um, address potential issues around missing steps or reconfiguring things incorrectly. And then also the ability to, re to right size the resources between the source and the targets. So if you want to change them, the number of CPUs that a workload has, the number of um, the amount of memory and so forth, you can change all of that stuff automatically. And with the ability to test before you do your cutover, obviously you're reducing the risk associated with doing these migrations. You can verify that um, when you've moved your 2000V server onto, say, a VMware or Hyper-V platform, that it's working okay before you then commit to do the cutover and it also gives you um, a back out plan should should you any problems be encountered. With the incremental sync you get uh, minimal service downtime so you know it's something you might be able to quite easily achieve within an hour or two of uh, downtime and you've got the ability to migrate back to your source as well uh, should you have a problem. And of course, you're just using one tool regardless of what platforms you're going to, whether you're going to do physical to physical, physical to virtual migrations, you can use one tool to do all of those things. So we have plenty of uh, enablement material on our website. Uh, should you wish to know more about it, there's obviously documentation on netiq.com. We also have um, trials for all our, all, of all our products, which you can download from the website as well as well as uh, demos and videos of seeing the product actually uh, in action, of course. If you do download a trial, you're welcome to technical support for that, and you can contact them within uh, various different ways. So let's look at um, a few upgrade scenarios. The most obvious one would be to do um, a physical to virtual migration. So using plate spin it would basically for there would be a two-step process you would 
migrate your 2003 server onto the virtual platform and you test that that server is okay. You may need to um, resize it, give it more disk space for its uh, C drive, for example, which it would accommodate that automatically. And then once you're sort of satisfied that um, that machine is working okay, you can then schedule the OS upgrade. And this, this may be done at the same time or may be done later. So once you've um, done that upgrade, you can obviously verify that everything is okay. Um, but if you if it doesn't if there's a problem then you do have a very simple rollback mechanism because you can just revert the machine back to its snapshot which you would have taken before you started it uh, and then you could potentially uh, retry. So undoing the OS upgrade is a, a simple process using uh, plate plate spin technology. So some of the benefits I've sort of outlined already. You can convert your machine to a VM with minimal downtime. You can resize it automatically to accommodate the new operating system. You don't have to reconfigure anything at the application layer because we're moving the entire workload as is with all of its applications and everything else intact. And should you need to fail back, it's very simple to do that. So it's, it is fast and it's safe. Now let's imagine you're going to do the same thing but without using plate spin you might choose to do a um, do it manually um, which means you're going to try and reinstall the application to the exact configuration it was before which uh, is going to be time consuming error prone and uh, expensive and there's very limited ways of sort of getting back should you encounter a problem at some point in the future so this, the second scenario would be migrating your server to another physical machine. So there are a couple of ways that you could do this with uh, PlateSpin. First of all, you could do a physical to physical migration. So you could take, the, um, take your 2003 server and move it as is straight to it, directly onto the new hardware. And it would take care of swapping out all the drivers that need to be changed so the, that's primarily the uh, disk drivers and the um, network drivers uh, and also the OS kernel. And then once it's on its new hardware and it's got enough capacity, then you can perform the upgrade. And of course, you can do testing at those. So if the upgrade fails in that scenario, you could just start the, 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 P, the physical to physical migration again. An alternative way of doing it would be to, to take your workload via a virtual platform. So you could, for example, migrate it onto Hyper-V or VMware. You could then upgrade the virtual machine and make sure that that's okay. So much like the first scenario. And if that all works okay, then you can basically take that virtual machine and, and push it onto your physical platform. So that would be doing a staged migration. So really the benefits there are just it's safer and it's faster than doing a manual build, but you also have much better failback options. You're not having to resort to uh, tape disk images and so forth to uh, recover a workload because of the, an uh, problem was encountered. And then the third scenario that we'd consider would be an in-situ upgrade where you're going to upgrade the, the, the original machine straight to 2008. So with PlateSpin, again, you could, you could take the approach I outlined in scenario two where um, the, you basically migrate that machine to a VM and then you've got effectively a backup of that machine should, should there be a problem. And you could either upgrade the source machine or indeed the, uh, the virtual machine itself. And uh, if let's say you, did the, you upgraded the virtual machine, you can then just uh, migrate it back onto the uh, original hardware. If you don't use plate spin, then yes, you could just start running the upgrade, but if it fails, then where are you going to restore that OS from? If you're going to use tape or disk imaging, um, that could be a timely uh, process. You may have to reinstall the operating system and uh, the recovery software before you can actually start restoring it, and so it could, could take a long time. So using our technology, you can basically test this scenario um, before you do it for real. And again, it's, the recovery is quite straightforward if, if there is an issue with the upgrade. 
So I'll just move on and show you what the uh, user interface looks like. So when you uh, open up the Migrate uh, user interface, you basically have this split panel affair where your discovered machines and uh, virtual infrastructure are listed. And you can, you can see detailed information about uh, the characteristics of those. And basically, you can just drag and drop uh, a work workload onto a new target. So that target could either be a, um, a hypervisor, you know, the SX host or something like that, or it could be a physical machine. And uh, when, you, when you drag and drop, you basically, it kicks off this wizard, which asks you what you want to do with the workload. So you basically have uh, a number of options. There's move, copy, and then there's various options around images. So there's, there's not much difference between a, a copy and a move. It's primarily around what happens to the migrate license at the end of the process. So because the migrate license is perpetual, um, you can choose whether it moves with the machine once it's migrated or whether it stays with the original. So when you're doing your initial uh, creation of the workload, you would select a copy. And then the, the license would stay with the uh, source machine so that you can do another migration on it later and, and do an incremental sync on it. But beyond that, there's not a huge difference between them. So then you, basically you can start, step through uh, a wizard which takes care of the, the most important um, settings that you need to configure within the, the migration job. So you start off at the top of the list and just work your way down to the bottom. And Migrate will point out any uh, issues. Either if, they're, if they have to be dealt with, then they'll be shown as here with a, a red cross on them. If they're just warnings, then they'll, they'll be yellow triangle symbols. So you start off with the uh, credentials for the source and target machine. You can then choose your transfer method, how you're going to transfer the data between the, the source machine and the target. And you've got the choice of using a file-based mechanism or a block-based mechanism. The key difference really is, uh, or the key decision here is whether you need to resize your disks. So if you need to resize a volume during the migration, then you have to use a file-based mechanism. You can't resize a volume using blocks. The other consideration is how much of the disk space um, is being used on, on the source volume. So let's say you had a, a 50 gig volume on your source server and it's only, only 10 gig of it is being used. Because if you use a selector, a block-based transfer, then the entire 50 gig will have to be transferred because every block has to be copied, um, whether it contains data or not. Whereas if you use a file-based mechanism, it will only transfer the, the files, so what is actually being used. So the other consideration is what type of application is uh, installed on the, on the system. If it's a transactional system like a, a database or a mail system, then generally speaking, a block-based mechanism is better because you're going to have very large files involved in there. And you don't want to have to transfer gigabytes of data just because the one block in the file changed. So those are the sorts of considerations to uh, take into account when you're choosing your transfer method. It is, I would say, that block-based is the more common method these days. So then you can configure the uh, host name and the uh, domain credentials. The, the main thing here is that when we're doing this initial replication, then we're keeping the original machine alive and on the network and doing its normal day-to-day -day job. So at that point, when we create this new machine, be it a physical or virtual host, um, it can't have the same network identity at this stage uh, as the original machine because it's already been used. So we have to give it a new name. Um, we may or may not choose to enroll it into Active Directory. You can, if you wish, create a new uh, SID for it, although that's not really necessary these days unless it's a domain controller that you're moving. And similarly as to the um, host name, 
you have to configure uh, IP settings. And there are two sets of IP settings here. There's one for what you want the source, the target machine to have once the migration is finished. And then there's also temporary IP settings while the migration is in progress. So typically speaking, during the, for temporary, you would set DHCP and then you give it a new IP uh, at the other end. And you can, if you're going onto a, a hypervisor, you can select which virtual network that's going to map to. So again, if you're going onto, say, VMware, then you might wish to keep the machine with the same IP address, but you could collect, select, connect it to a, a non-production network so that it could keep the same IP address as the source machine, depending on whether that was a, a requirement for the for the application not to change IP address. So when you're going onto a, a virtual platform, and this is these screenshots are from a VMware conversion, then you can choose things like where the configuration files are going to be stored, where the which data source are going to be used, and um, you know, how much resources the machine is the virtual machine is going to have. So one important sort of point about migrate is that there are effectively two migration modes. There's what we call fully automatic and uh, also semi-automatic. So fully automatic is where we're migrating onto a virtual platform, either VMware or Hyper-V, and where migrate will create the machine, the virtual machine, on that uh, host and boot it up automatically. So when you step through the migration wizard like this, it will automatically set that machine to have the same resources as the original one in terms of CPU and memory. But uh, you may wish to uh, reduce that because you could you could have a very old multi-core processor um, on for your source machine, which is several years old, um, but it doesn't necessarily need that going onto a brand new bit of hardware with a with a modern processor which could be several orders of magnitude faster. But if you in, sort of want to kind of get more of an insight into what resource requirements are around those when you're doing these conversions, then that's where Plate Spin Recon can really come in and give you those uh, answers. So again, when we're going onto a virtual platform, then we'll take care of um, VMware tools as well. We can, we'll install it if it's not present, we'll, it will replace them, upgrade them if that's required as well. So it asks for credentials to do that. In this example, with these screenshots, this shows how you can reconfigure uh, the volume sizes if you're doing a file-based transfer. So um, you can set yeah, how big it's good, the total size, or you can set a certain amount free or in percentages or gigabytes, or you can leave it as it was. So if you have a very small OS partition and it needs more, more space to accommodate uh, Server 2008, then you can just uh, allocate more disk space here, and then when Migrate creates the VM, it will automatically create create it with the, the right amount of space. You can also select here which volumes are going to be migrated, so you always have to take the OS partition, but if there are, for example, SAN attached drives, that sort of thing, uh, then you, you would typically not transfer those because you would just take the, the local disks transfer those and then reconnect your SAN attached or your network attached storage um, at the other end once you've finished the migration. You can configure how the uh, virtual disks are going to be stored, where they're going to be stored, what they're called, how multiple volumes are going to be handled and the they store and all of that stuff. And then you can kick off the, the migration. You, 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 you may notice there are some other steps down here, but I'll show you some screenshots of those uh, momentarily. So once you kick off a migration job, then Placement Migrate takes care of that in the background, and it, you can check on it periodically, see how it's going. You can see what all the steps are that need to be done for this uh, migration job to be completed, and you can go in and you can drill in and see what, uh, more detail on it, and it will give you a, a, a progress report. And then once the migration job is completed, then you get a report showing what was done, 
and also towards the bottom you get information about the file transfer speed and, and that kind of thing. So that, that takes care of uh, an initial migration of your workload and what you end up at that point with is a is essentially a copy of your original machine, probably with a new host name, may or may not have a different IP address. And what you can do then is you can test that workload. You can just spin it up in a, an isolated network, uh, do all the testing that you wish to do, make sure it's all okay. And at some point, you'll then want to uh, do a, an incremental sync to bring that workload uh, up to date because obviously the application has been running the whole time so the, the system has changed. So what we do here is um, we do what's called a prepare for synchronization and what that does is basically boot that new machine whether it's physical or virtual uh, off an ISO image that we provide with our software that then registers it into migrate and makes it available to be uh, updated. So again, in a fully automatic environment where your uh, that machine is a virtual machine, then that's completely automated. Migrate will take care of the, the the starting and stopping of that VM and booting off the ISO. If it was a physical server that your target was, then you would basically put the ISO in this DVD in and just start the machine up, and you could enter in the the URL for the migrate server, and it would then appear in the console. And once you've done that, you can then uh, right-click on it within the GUI and do a prepare for synchronization. So that uh, gives you uh, another wizard that comes up and for the purposes of demonstration I've switched to uh, a more advanced wizard that the GUI gives you which has all of the settings that you saw before but also some others which I'll sort of take you through. So again you can see here um, because I've Doing, uh, I've already migrated this server, then it gives me the option to do a, an incremental sync. Again, I can select my transfer method, but typically you, you you stick to one transfer method. There's no point, for example, if you've done a block-based, a file-based mechanism to then transfer to block-based because when you do a file-based transfer, it changes all the, ent the entire block structure. So it would basically end up replicating the whole machine again. So you can set within here what the uh, end states of the, the respective machines are. So you can say whether you're going to shut down the source or the target or whatever. So during an incremental sync, uh, you would probably keep the source machine alive and then turn off the target machine. Whereas when you come to do your cutover job, which is you, you're just following the same wizard, then you would select to shut down the, the source machine. You can, when you're kind of transferring over the WAN, you can... Um, enable throttling, so if you, you want to limit the bandwidth that uh, Platesmin uses to transfer the data, you can set your value in uh, megabits per second, and you can also put a time range on that, so you can, for example, throttle it during office hours and let it uh, use whatever is available uh, outside of that time. You can potentially, uh, if you wish, encrypt and even and compress the data. Uh, that will slow it down, but uh, maybe necessary on a slower bandwidth link. Migrate has um, it's very robust as far as uh, network tolerance is concerned. It's designed to work over slow, high high latency links. It's very good at recovering uh, and picking up from where it left off if if there is an interruption or it encounters a problem. You can schedule these uh, jobs to happen at a later time if you wish. And uh, one neat feature is the ability to set up uh, scheduled email notifications. So um, if you set these things off overnight, for example, then you can say, right, send me an email every few hours and let me know that everything's okay. And if there's a problem, it will, sell, it will send you uh, an email. So that's quite handy where to, to avoid those scenarios where you set up a number of migrations and then something goes wrong half an hour after you left the office. If you don't have to wait until the, the following morning to find out there was a problem, you get a, an email notification. So that's kind of a, a nice little feature there, really. <clears throat> and then you can configure, as I mentioned before, these post-migration actions, which is basically any command line activity, any executable can be uh, downloaded from the migrate server to the 
the target machine and then executed so any form of scripting command line and that's just does uh, additional sort of configurations that might be unique to your environment. So you can also set services um, to be reconfigured both during the transfer and post transfer. So this one that I'm showing you now is more relevant to when you're doing the final cutover. So at some point when you do that final cutover and you're going to uh, turn off the source machine, you do have to stop the application while that happens so that you get complete application consistency um, at the end. So you can just uh, select which services are going to be stopped during that process. But you can also select post-migration, the start state of uh, any of any Windows server. So let's say, for example, you've got a, a HP server and it's got the Insight Manager hardware agent on it, or maybe a Dell server with Open Manage. Then you don't want those services trying to start up when on a VMware uh, or Hyper-V platform. So you can set those services to be disabled automatically so that when the machine comes up, they're disabled. So PlaceBeam won't automatically uninstall them, but you could potentially do that through a, a post-migration action just to call the uh, uninstaller to get rid of it completely. So just by way of a, a summary, then using our technology, you can plan your upgrade strategies with confidence. You can be sure that your your workloads are on a supported platform for doing the OS up upgrade and you can make sure they've got and those that hardware has the capacity to run it and you can also um, make sure the OS partition is big and is large enough. You can resize the workloads to make the best use of the uh, infrastructure and virtualize as many workloads as possible onto that virtual platform and that's where Placebin Recon can really sort of help. And when you come to do the migration, you can do it safely because of the amount of testing that you can do, and you can do it with a pretty minimal disruption because of the incremental sync, and also with the high degree of automation, there's a much less manual reconfiguration and uh, manual effort that's required in order to do these. And with the, particularly using the command line interface, you can really scale these up and you can do multiple systems uh, simultaneously. So, and because we've got the ability to go from anywhere to anywhere, then there are various ways that you can fail back. It may be as simple as just reverting to a snapshot once you, you do it, but um, if you have to migrate back to a physical machine, you've got, a, you've got a, a route using migrate to actually sync back. And with the scalability of the, of the tool, you could do potentially up to 40 workloads we've had customers doing simultaneously. And that's not a hard-coded limit in our technology. It's more about VMware's capability to stream that many workloads into the system simultaneously. So we start to run into uh, issues around the disk I/O once we kind of get to that towards that that amount of workloads. But it's a very very scalable system. So that's pretty much all I wanted to uh, cover today. And so I can. Uh, open up for questions. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, so, yeah, if you do have any questions, you can just pop those in the questions box, and that is just at the right hand side of your screen. Okay, so I have a question here from Rasika, um, who has said, can you upgrade the OS at the same time with Migrate? What happens to the legacy applications which are running on the old OS? Can you migrate from 32-bit to 62-bit? And what about enterprise to standard to enterprise, sorry, what about enterprise to standard and standard to enterprise applications like SQL? Can you migrate to cloud platforms? Do you want me to break that down? That was quite long. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover. I think I've got a reasonable idea of what you're asking there. I'll, I'll cover most of that. And if, if I miss anything, please tell me. Um, so migrate isn't does not take care of up performing the, the application upgrades. 
So migration, place we migrate is purely about moving the workload from one physical platform to some other platform, be that another physical server or a virtual platform, and putting it into a place where it can be upgraded. Um, we don't care, take care of the Microsoft upgrade. And we're also, there are limitations to how you can do this anyway. You, they, they, Microsoft themselves offer no ability to upgrade an operating system from 32-bit to 64-bit. So yes, if you've got a 64-bit Windows to Server 2003, you can potentially take it to 2008 R2. But if you've got a 32-bit operating system, which is most of them, then you are limited to, to Windows 2008 32-bit. There is no upgrade mechanism on the market to get you to automatically upgrade a Windows server from 6, 32 to 64 bits. And that's true of applications as well and you know, versions like standard and uh, enterprise edition. Our technology works well within um, cloud platforms. So if you were going to migrate to the cloud, then pretty much a lot of what I've said is uh, equally applicable to that. The key difference I think would be, let's say you're going to go into uh, some cloud provider, we would do what you would do what we would consider to be a, uh, a semi-automated migration, whereby your VM, you create your VM inside the cloud, you spin it up off the ISO image we'll provide you, and that registers it into our migrate server, where you can then treat it just like a physical migration. So hopefully that covers all the different parts of your question, but if not, I'll happily expand. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have another question here, uh, which is from Paul, who has said, uh, we have a set of legacy .NET 1.1 and .NET 2 web applications running under IIS and referencing SQL Server 2000, running on 32-bit Windows 2000, 2003 under VMware. We want to migrate to Windows 2008 R2. What would be the approach? Again, you, um, you're looking at some kind of app, application reinstall for that because there is no direct upgrade path that Microsoft provides to do that. So you are looking at a rebuild. Um, but obviously you have to look into whether the application can be transferred. I mean, obviously if it's primarily .NET and IIS, you're probably going to be okay, but you are going to have to manually recreate the application on the new platform. There is no direct upgrade from 32-bit to 64-bit platforms. Okay, thank you, Alain. Um, so we have a question here from Ian, um, who said, do you recommend using plate spin to migrate domain controllers? Yeah, um, we're completely agnostic as far as the um, application layer is concerned. Um, so we, we have customers who've done domain controller upgrades. It de I guess it depends whether you're upgrading the functional level as well. Organizations I've seen who've kind of gone through from 2000 to 2003 and then 2003 to 2008 and onwards have typically implemented a brand new AD structure for that and um, that sat alongside the uh, old one. Um, but yes, our technology is perfectly capable of migrating a domain controller. I, I recent, a while ago I did um, a proof of concept implementation for a customer and um, they they migrated their domain controller sort of they inadvertently selected a live migration of it rather than doing a, 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 a an initial copy and uh, so it basically Placebin did it all in one step and once they got over their shock of what they'd actually done because they did it in the middle of the day, uh, they were mightily impressed when they realized that not a single user noticed that their domain controller moved. Uh, and the only person who did notice was the um, domain admin when he spotted that his DC was suddenly in a different OU because it had a DHCP IP address rather than a fixed IP. But at no time were users interrupted by that. So it works fine from a technological point of view. And that's true for other applications. It doesn't matter whether it's SQL, Exchange, you know, whatever the application is, we're, 
we're pretty much agnostic. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, so I think that looks like it's all the questions we have today. Um, Okay, yeah, so I think that's it. Um, so as mentioned previously, um, if you could fill out the critique form at the end, we'd really, really appreciate that. And you can also request a call back if you'd like some more information. Um, so thanks again for joining us and thanks, Alain, for presenting today. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.